to our identity. Then we looked at how we live in a complex and anxious age, and because of that, we should be forming cultural discernment based upon the Bible. And last week I talked about isolation and mistrust and how the importance of meaningful intergenerational relationships matter. This week, we're going to look at practice number four, which is to ground and motivate an ambitious generation, train for vocational discipleship. Now, next week, we're going to look at countercultural mission, that Christianity actually calls us to a completely different mission, and many times, it's completely different than the culture. And so, we've looked at this book, and it's a five-week sermon series, and after this sermon series, so last, uh, next week will be the last week of this sermon series, we are going to shift gears and look at the Sermon on the Mount. One of the best sermons that has ever been preached, if not the best, preached by Jesus, and we're going to dissect it and look at it and hopefully learn some wisdom from the best teacher of wisdom that has ever existed in Jesus. Before we jump into uh, this practice number four, I just want to read our key verse, which is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Something that we've been reading each and every week and then sending you off with it with a benediction, but is a crux to 1 Peter and what I think Christianity in general. The dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans. Though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits. So breaking down this um, uh, practice number four, to ground and motivate an ambitious generation trained for vocational discipleship. The first part of this is an ambitious generation. And this is specifically talking about the next generation, Gen Z. And you might initially disagree with this, right? You might say, I don't think that that generation is very ambitious. But I would argue that they are very ambitious. They, uh, in music, in entertainment, everybody wants to be famous these days. And they can be through like TikTok famous or they can even own their own business. It's actually been very easy to do these things or at least get on these platforms. But the complaint from the older generation or older generations is that they're not paying their dues. They're not paying their dues. They haven't paid enough. They don't work hard enough. They ha want more responsibility than they deserve. And they want opportunities before they are ready. And I think that these are good voices of concern. Right? They're important voices of concern. But the truth is, young people are ambitious. Sometimes they're more ambitious than their ability. But ambition is a good thing. And we should look at it in a positive light. So ambitious is good. It's how you approach it of whether it is good or not. And we need to lead them towards the good, right? The next generation, or if you're part of the next generation, you need to be led towards something. And this says to ground and motivate. Those sound contradictory. It sounds like, well, you want to ground, but also motivate us. But really, there are two opposite things that work together that when we remain in tension between the two, actually turn out to be the truth. And so looking at ground, right, the, the word ground is making something abstract to be something Practical, And we do this in theology all the time. A lot of theologians will talk about theology in the abstract, like who is God, what, all this different kind of stuff. But theology is meant to be 
speaking to the here and now. And while that abstract is good, theology is no good that doesn't influence our lives for us to live by it. All theology is like this. In fact, what I will say is the Bible is a very grounding book. It takes things that are deep and big questions like what is the meaning of life and it grounds it to here and now. Colossians 3, 17 says this, a very practical thing. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. It's talking about practical things, right? The small and insignificant things are truly vital to our lives. I want you to think about your most important relationship, whatever that may be. Maybe it's being a, a mother or a father. Maybe it's being a husband or a wife. Maybe it's being a good friend, or maybe it is being a good sibling, a good child to your parents. Whatever you're going through, these might be vital to you. Those are the most important things you can do in life. It's not necessarily what you do in the public sphere. It's what you do with the small or seemingly insignificant things. These things truly matter. In fact, I would argue that the small things matter more than the big things. Speaking from personal experience, my worldview or my ideas or my thought process have been more influenced by the people I've sat down and talked to than a religious leader out there speaking who I've never met. Who profoundly affected me were real relationships. We need to recapture this grounding a little bit. For us and for the next generation, we're always looking to change the world and do amazing things. And I think this is important. But what's more important is being a good husband, father, mother, <coughs> wife. These, the significance of the everyday is what's important. And we look at motivation, which is to stimulate someone's enthusiasm towards something. We need to remember that God has something for everyone. God has something for you to do today. And I can't tell you that, but God can. He has something significant for you to do. And then this last one is vocational discipleship. So what is a vocation? What is a vocation? Well, it's a work, career, ministry, or even a relational position. That your vocation is could be any of these things. It could be your career. It could just be a job that you are doing. Or maybe it's being a stay-at-home mother. Or maybe you're retired and it's just being a good child to your aging parent. But it all ties back to identity. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. This is written right before 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12, which is our key verse. It says this, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. This is Peter speaking to the Christians, and it is the same today as it was back then. This is for you. It's spoken over you as a church. It says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This gives us this idea of a royal priesthood. That we are a priesthood of all believers, that you actually are a priest. You're a priest. You are a priest of Jesus Christ. If you are living in Jesus, you are a priest. 
And this is important. So I actually had to do a project on priesthood. And uh, I'm sitting in my office working on this project. And Elliot walked in and I said, hey, what do you think of priesthood? And Elliot said something along the lines of, well, they've had the Catholic Church priests have had their scandals in the past couple of years. And it hasn't been good because this is what we think of when we talk about priesthood. Right? We think of the Catholic Church, the Catholics are priests, but that is not what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that you are a priest, that you're an ambassador for Christ, that in fact, as a Christian, you're a priest that goes to God for other people and goes to people for God. That's what a priest does. Now, we in Christianity... Uh, especially Protestant Christianity, we have these things called pastors. And we all love pastors, right? That's, a, that's an important thing, to love a pastor. But we don't have priests. But what I would argue is that for the church to thrive, the church Big C, the whole American church, and also this church, is that the pastor has to become less significant. So we kind of put our pastors on a pedestal. I know we don't do that here, but some churches put their pastor on a pedestal. And we say, okay, this is the person who is doing the work. Right? We come to church, we hang out, but the pastor is the one that gets people in the church. The pastor is the one who preaches and studies and does all this thing. The pastor does the spiritual things, and I will live my life. Maybe he evangelizes too, or he leads in certain ways. But this is actually not the correct modern concept of church. In fact, I would argue the correct vision of this is that a pastor is like a captain of a very large ship. So if you've ever seen a small ship, usually there's just a couple people on that ship, and they are kind of controlling everything, that everybody does everything. But a large ship... The captain is directing the direction, giving vision for the direction, but they are not rowing or moving the sails or doing any of that stuff. The correct vision of a pastor is that they are empowering others, that it isn't just the pastor that does things, it's everyone does things. And if we want our church to grow, if we want things to happen, it won't be because of me. It won't be because of me. It will be, be because I'm casting a vision that we all get on board with, and then we all live out our faith as the priesthood of all believers. So what does this mean? It means that we are living out our calling from God. Whatever your calling is, I can't explain your calling to you. I can just give you hints of what your calling might be. But you need to live out your calling for God. And this, of course, answers the question, what am I called to do with my life? I've described the church as a workshop before, and it, I think it's also important to look at it as this training center that trains people out and lifts them up and helps them find Jesus and then sends them out to live out that faith. Here's the issue. There's an issue with this. And that's churches don't do this well. Churches do not do this well. In fact, churches are really good at preparing people for ministry, but not to prepare people for their calling. That sometimes we're just saying, hey, you are going to do this in the church and this in the church, and I will prepare you to do this. But what if God has called me to do something outside of the church? What if God has just called me to be a parent? Or what if God has just called me to be in the blue-collar work field? Well, he has something for you there, but the church hasn't always done a good job of preparing those people for that. But if we're talking about resilient disciples, which is what this book is about, preparing resilient disciples, 
we need to be reproducing ourselves. Which means that whatever you do well, it's all matters in Christianity. So if you're a mother, you need to reproduce and help other mothers become the best mother that they can be. Or if you're a blue-collar person, you have to help and reproduce how you live out your faith in the blue-collar workforce. If you're a lawyer, you're going to help people to live out their faith as a lawyer. So what are we called to do? Well, there's this guy named Sky Jathani, and he gives three things that our calling should fall under to help us say, okay, this is a calling from God or not a calling from God. And these three things are create beauty, create beauty, cultivate abundance, and generate order. So this is a litmus test of, hey, am I living according to to my calling from God, or am I not? And this goes back to creation. The first cha three chapters of Genesis are vitally important for us today. If you think that the first three chapters is just an origin story, you are missing so much in Genesis. In Genesis, the first three chapters of Genesis talk about the creation of the world, the creation of humans in God's image. And so, they give us something more than an origin story. That humans are designed to create beauty. Now, here's the thing. Out of these things, create beauty, cultivate abundance, and generate order, you can do these in a sinful manner. You can do these things away from God. But when we're living the way that we were designed to live, we will do these and they will fulfill our calling and our vocation to God. So create beauty. I'm talking about art and music. Each and every song that we sing on a Sunday morning, somebody has written it and then somebody has to play it and we hear it. Or uh, pictures of art every picture of the Last Supper or a beautiful landscape was created by somebody and points towards God. Now I would say that there's also um, videos and movies and TV shows that are all creative endeavors. But the problem is that Hollywood has a different value system than Christians. And they Pop culture has a different value system than Christians. We need to be creating things in competition that not only are beautiful, but they point towards God. I would say there's also moments of beauty. Maybe you can think of times in your life or stories in your life where you have seen beauty in amazing ways that have pointed you towards God. If we're creators of beauty, we should be creators of these moments. The most beautiful thing I've ever seen are children. That this is an endeavor of creating beauty. We are made in the image of the creator God. We're made in the image of the creator God. And he created things out of nothing. Now we are limited. We can only create things out of something. But he created things out of nothing. Part of our calling is to create. But this creation should point people towards the living God. Now, of course, this can be done improperly. There can be images created that defame God. And we have to be careful of this, and this is the pitfall. The next thing is to cultivate abundance. Cultivate abundance. That there were, uh, in the time of creation, there were already trees that God created that produced fruit. If you remember, there were many trees in the garden. There was one that they were not supposed to eat, but there were many trees in the garden. And God still said, subdue the land. Provide more access to food and simplicity of figuring out how to uh, declutter your life and truly find the things that matter. 
to create people, uh, to create things that people enjoy, to cultivate abundance. Now, this can be used pro improperly as well. It can lead to consumerism and gluttony, which are problematic. And then the final one is to generate order. If you remember, what was Adam's first task to do, but to name the animals, to generate order. This could be help identify problems, create better solutions, problem solving before the problems happen. All these things fall into that, and I think the, this can be done poorly through legalism. You have to live a particular way to fall into the in crowd. But all of this, if we start to look, your vocation should fall into one of these things. Because ultimately, your vocation should benefit the world. It should help the world out. So when we're talking about vocation and calling, there's some practices that we can do to discover our purpose. So start the discovery process is the first one of finding your purpose. Start the discovery process, or start the discovery of finding your purpose. This is a lifelong journey, and there might be some purposes in life that are just for a season, and then there's other ones that you are called to <coughs> for your whole lives. When you become a parent, for the rest of your life, you are called to be a parent. I think that nothing of meaning just happens. Nothing of meaning just happens. Instead, if you're going to do something significant, it takes prayer of deciphering, hey, what is my purpose, God? What are you calling me to do? And we should be praying about our vocation. We shouldn't just do it. We should be praying about it. Because if we believe that there is a God of the universe, he has something to say about it. And he might even help us do it better. So we need to be praying and attempting to do it. That we need practice and trial and error. It's a discovery process. But here's the truth. If you're still alive today, God has something for you to do. If you are still alive today, God has something for you to do today. Now, this isn't always pretty. If you're still on this earth, God has something for you to do, but it isn't always nice or perfect. I think when we think of Colin, we think of, oh, how, how am I going to be this wonderful person or change the world or whatever? But it might be a little bit messier than we like to admit. Let me tell you about a prisoner. He was known as a Prisoner 16670. And so you might be thinking, what are we going to learn about a prisoner, about our vocation and calling? Well, he was a Auschwitz prisoner in Auschwitz. And a prisoner had escaped. Not this one, but a prisoner had escaped. And so the Nazis decided, we're going to kill 10 other prisoners to help people determine, hey, I'm not going to try to escape anymore. And these 10 men were chosen, and prisoner 16670 was Maximilian Colby, and he was not picked. Instead, somebody else was picked, and um, he stepped in for his place. When somebody else was picked, he had a wife and children, and a lot of life left to live. And so Maximilian Colby stepped in and said, this man has a wife and children, and I will step in his place and die for him. And they set him aside, and they starved them to death. And in fact, they were taking so long to die that they injected him with poison. He ended up dying. And you think that the story would stop there, but it doesn't. In fact, the story started to spread about this man's sacrifice, and a young man named Carol 
boy being walked, heard about it. And you might say, oh, I've never heard of this person. It obviously wasn't that important. He was actually uh, turned out to be Pope John Paul II. So you might recognize Pope John Paul II. And what is the significance of him? Well, Pope John Paul II heard of this story, this encouraging Catholic priest from Poland, and he began to visit Poland in the 70s. <coughs> now, why is this significant? Because during this time, Poland was part of the USSR. And he began to speak to these people about having courage and using Maximilian Kobe as an example. And in fact, this led to the Solidarity Labor Movement in Poland, and communists would fall in Poland, and many historians point towards John Paul II's influence there. And the USSR began to crumble, and communists began to fall, and it can all be tied back to one man's courage of saying, hey, I'm going to die for another person. So obviously this doesn't paint a great picture of your calling or purpose, but no matter what, we have something to do and we can step in, especially as Christians, even if that doesn't look perfect. The second point is that we need to practice it by working through your gifts and aligning them with God. There are many gifts that defame God that are not helpful, but you can use your gifts and start to align them with God. And it's as simple as saying, am what I am doing glorifying God? Is what I do glorifying God? This is a question we should ask about everything we do, because no prayer is wasted, but can your gifting help another Christian? Can your gifting help encourage somebody or lead somebody to Christ? And this can, again, be in the small things. I believe that God should be proclaimed throughout the earth, in every corner, in unique spaces. He should be proclaimed. So asking these questions, and what I am doing, is that glorifying God? And if the answer is no, can it? Can you figure out a way? Am I any different than a non-Christian? There's an interesting saying that if our church disappeared tomorrow, would anybody notice? But another good question would be, if I die tomorrow, would anybody point out that I helped lead people towards God? When I was a manager at Home Depot, so I worked at Home Depot for five years, and I became a manager, and I was actually promoted, and then all my fellow co-workers, uh, I was promoted from within, and then I became their boss, and what I found was my hard working around them helped let me have spiritual conversations, but what I also noticed was now that I was promoted, I stopped being able to have those spiritual conversations. It hindered it. But the people who were not under my management were able to start listening. And I was able to bring God into the workplace and people began to come to church or go to church again because now I could tell my coworkers about Jesus. Working at Home Depot doesn't seem all that spiritual, but I was able to align it to a place, and my giftings of working there were able to glorify God. The next point is number three. Start looking towards the Bible for how it applies to your vocation. So I think... Uh, the church does a pretty good job of figuring out a theology of what it means to be a pastor or shepherd of the church. I think we have a good theology of who God is, what the church is. 
But make good theology of what it means to be a stay-at-home mom. We don't have good theology of what it means to become elderly and age. We don't have a good theology of what it means to be in the blue-collar workforce or a teacher or managing. Here's the truth. The Bible has something to say about your profession, your vocation, your career. And we really need to start developing this. What does the Bible have to say about what you do each and every day? And here's the thing. It probably doesn't come right out and say it. Instead, you got to look deeply at it. How can we figure out how to live out our faith no matter what? And this leads to the last point, that we need to live out your faith. You need to live out your faith. I need to live out my faith in the workplace. That this applies to everybody. Right? That we need to show Christ. We need to show why he is so attractive. And honestly, I think what we need to say is, hey, everything good about me comes from God. Everything bad about me, well, that's me. That's where I've fallen short, where I've missed it. But everything good comes from from God. And here's the truth. Your workplace needs Jesus. Whether it is working in a place where there's a bunch of Christians, you need more Jesus. Whether it's a place where a, a Christian would not step foot in, it needs Jesus. And to close, I'll, I'll tell a story. And I have a quote with this story. This is a quote from many years ago. And it's <coughs> critiquing Christians in situations. So it says, uh, things have come to a particularly troublesome situation when religion is allowed to invade public life. So what the speaker there is saying is, hey, it's actually very bad if Christianity comes to the public life. You can believe in Jesus, just keep that to yourself. Don't bring that into the workplace. Don't Tell people about your faith. Just leave it at home. For a Christian, this is impossible to do. And you may be unfamiliar with this quote, but it was made by Lord Melbourne, who was a member of British Parliament. But he was a member of British Parliament at a particular time. He was a member with William Wilberforce, who was the one who ended the slave trade. And what he is saying is, hey, he wants slaves, and so this his opponent is a Christian, and this is a nuisance. But William Wilberforce said, no, I have a calling, and that is to end the atrocities of the slave trade. William Wilberforce spent 43 years arguing for the freedom of and the cancellation of the slave trade. 43 years. He lived out his faith. He was critiqued. And he argued from a Christian perspective. Because God had something there. What I will say is God has the same calling to you. Would you stand with me today? Lord, we thank you so much that you are actively participating in the church, that you are actively participating in the world, and that you have something for each and every one of us to do. Help light, light a fire in us, stir our hearts as we are prepared to live out whatever you have called us to do. Go before us in whatever we are doing, whether it's being a parent, working in a shop, or working in an office space, would you go before each and every one of us and be helping show us what you have called us to do, that unique calling 
that we each one of us has. We thank you that you are good and that you are working. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.